Um, I called uh, uh, my dear friend Sarah, who you know, before I came here, and she said, oh, you should make sure you tell Rabbi Browse that Sarah thinks I desperately need the counsel of a rabbi. <laughs> I think that's clear to all of us now, John. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome to the stage the author of The Amen Effect. It's Rabbi Sharon Brous. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. Come on in. <laughs> How are you doing? Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, John. All right. A Jewish castaway washes up oh, <laughs> on a remote, uncharted island. And to his surprise, there's another Jewish castaway who's already there. Here, let me show you around, says the old castaway to the new castaway. He points at various rocks and trees and says, this is the butcher, this is the florist, this is the synagogue, this is the baker, this is the tailor, this is the other synagogue, this is the cobbler. Wait, 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 interrupts the new castaway. Surely for one man on an island, you don't need two synagogues. Yeah, but this is the one we don't go to. <laughs> Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> You talk in the book about a crisis of loneliness and isolation. You also talk about the way organized religion has failed to answer that crisis that often people are forced to choose between uh, religion that's extreme and cruel on one hand or religion that's routine and a bit detached on the other, sort of crazy or boring. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about what you view as the cost of that failure and the ways you think we should address it? Well... Wow, thank you. I'm glad you're not asking me about the reverse cowgirl thing from, <laughs> from Mindy. <laughs> the way <laughs> I do. <laughs> That's a relief. I, I do have an answer to the zombie and werewolf question, though, okay. by the way, <laughs> for later. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> Um, so here's the thing. Human beings um, have fundamental spiritual needs. We have a need to connect to each other. We are relational beings, and we have a need to um, connect beyond ourselves also, maybe to something greater than any of us. And when religious institutions and religion generally fails to address those needs because it's either deadly, meaning extreme, regressive, cruel, um, or already dead, meaning routine and boring and cowardly. So then there's this whole world of human need that's not being addressed by faith communities. And so I think the challenge really is to, to do the work of sacred excavation and to figure out these traditions that have survived for thousands of years. It's not for nothing. There's incredible wisdom there. And if we can translate some of these ancient ideas about um, the human condition, about what it, what we should aspire to in the world, then we can actually use some really powerful, very old tools to help address some of the greatest problems facing us as human beings today. One thing that I've just noticed as I'm getting older is I see that when people form couples or families, especially families, a lot of just the the having of kids creates community, whether it's in the school. I think a lot of Jewish parents rediscover that they want their kids to be Jewish and and sort of the bar mitzvah is, you know, it's an old joke, right? That kids go to temple until their bar mitzvah, then they don't show up again until their kids have to be bar mitzvahed. Um, and then I do see that like, just in my own experience that, that, that when there are, we have this problem of young men, but also older men who just have no one, they have fewer friends. I see it in my own life, even as I get older, that like, that, women on their own there's a they're they're just better and so <laughs> and so they say they just they are they're more they just are better at seeking these things out of being emotionally connected of knowing of being aware a little bit more of their own needs of other people's needs so much of what we have to do right now is figure out how to talk to the men that are trying to find meaning in Joe Rogan trying to find meaning in in right wing politics trying to find meaning in Jordan Peterson uh, how do you think about reaching the kind of people that don't realize that what they're missing, what they could benefit from, is a kind of community that isn't speaking to their worst impulses? It's so interesting because I think about that need for belonging, and a lot of people are finding it in these kind of, you know, these, these dark corners of the internet. They're finding other people who can sort of share their 
um, share their their sense of of loneliness and detachment and and their sense of rejection from the world. And so, what we have to do is create environments where people feel that they can belong and have a different kind of dream of, you know, what that shared purpose could look like, but not in a place that will cause harm to other people and not in a fantasy that will cause harm to other people. Um, so I know I was just with um, with this professor David Williams from Harvard recently, and he said that the studies actually show he's a, he does he's a data guy, and he said the studies actually show that people who go to church or synagogue or mosque once a week they will live seven and a half years longer, and for actually for Black Americans who go once a week they will live thirteen years longer. If they, go, if they engage in this kind of rhythmic encounter with community. And so the idea is like to actually build and then to, and then to engage ourselves in these kind of spaces that allow us to, to find meaning, to find purpose, and to feel a sense of belonging so that we don't seek it out elsewhere. So I, I wanted to talk to you about Israel. You've been for a long, you for a long time have spoken out against Israel's occupation of Gaza and the West Bank, you've talked about how we are called upon to tell the truth, to not look away, especially for those of us who are raised to believe in the project of Israel. Right now, half the population of Gaza is on the brink of starvation. It is on top of tens of thousands of people who have died as a result of the war that Hamas launched on October 7th, but that Israel has conducted with a disregard for Palestinian life, including children, that is indefensible, even if you believe Israel has a right to defend itself what does it mean to you right now not to look away? So it means we have to be big hearted enough that we can actually hold multiple things at once. One is that Israel was attacked in horrific atrocities, um, the worst since the Holocaust on October 7th. And that's just true and that's a fact. And some of the, some of the most painful parts of the last five months um, for many people is witnessing the denial and the justification and even the celebration of those atrocities by people who say that they care about human rights and human dignity. It's just, it's just not acceptable. And at the same time to hold the reality that if you believe that every single person is created in God's own image, which I do, then the death of any single person is a travesty. And what we're witnessing now is just an extraordinary amount of human suffering. And when I, as a mother and as a Jew and as a human being, read stories about Palestinian mothers feeding their children animal feed and grass to try to keep them alive, I'm absolutely shattered by it. And those two truths, the truth that my family was attacked in these brutal, atrocious acts, and that Palestinians are suffering in a, to in a totally horrific way, and that that needs to end, don't actually contradict each other. It's precisely because of my own pain and my own sorrow that my heart and my eyes are open and able to see the sorrow of Palestinian people as well. Ultimately, John, I mean, the only future is a just and shared future for Israelis and Palestinians together. I think the most important thing that people who care about justice can do is amplify and platform and resource the Israelis and Palestinians who are working for that just and shared future right now and help them instead of harming them by creating these kind of false binaries where you win, you lose, you're the victim, you're the villain, and instead say, this is too many people have died. There is too much suffering here. We have to figure out a better way. Can you talk about what it was like when you were confronted by an ultra-Orthodox? What led to that moment? Um, and what what happened after? Yeah, so my whole the whole premise of the book is rooted in this one paradigm. Can I just share this yeah. with you? Please. So the paradigm that is kind of the central metaphor for the book is this ancient pilgrimage ritual from uh, the time of the Temple Mount. So 2,000 years old when hundreds of thousands of Jews would make their way up to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and they would enter through this beautiful arched entryway and turn to the right and circle around the perimeter of the courtyard and then exit, like the Hajj. They were just this mass movement of people, except for someone who was brokenhearted, who would turn to the left. And they would have this sacred encounter where the brokenhearted person would be met with someone who would see them in their humanity and in their brokenness and ask them, what happened to you? And that person would say, I am bereft, I am bereaved, I am ill, you know, I'm worried about my kid, I'm, uh, you know, I'm lonely and they would receive a blessing from the person or the people going in this direction. So it's this totally counter-instinctual ritual where what we wanna do is pull away, but what we do instead is incline toward each other. 
And at the uh, at the end of the book, I share that actually there are two people who turn to the left, not just the brokenhearted, but also the ostracized. And when the ostracized go to the left, they too are, these are people who've caused great harm to the community, and they too are received with curiosity and with compassion, even though they've caused grave harm. So some years ago, I was invited by the president of the state of Israel to come be part of a of a, a very small group of people, 36 Jews from Israel and around the country, around the world, to try to figure out what, if anything, we had in common. And we spent three or four days together trying to really work through this question. It was fascinating, secular, religious, you know, right wing, left wing. Um, and we found very little that we agreed upon. At the end, he asked me to stand up and speak representing uh, my perspective as an American Jew. And I shared that I was, deeply, I was deeply concerned about a lot of the things that I saw unfolding in Israel, including a, um, a, a real, a, a new violent religious extremism in the Jewish population that I was deeply concerned was gonna push us off the edge of the abyss. And afterwards, I was confronted by one of the leaders of the settler movement, um, ultra-Orthodox, living in the West Bank, um, in an illegal settlement, and he just cornered me and started shouting at me that, you know, I was lying, this was propaganda, none of this was true, that I was harming the Jewish people by speaking this way, etc. And then he paused for a moment and he said, you know, you really hurt me with what you said about violent religious extremism. And I noticed that his whole demeanor shifted when he said that I hurt him, and mine did too. And so I just, I just turned to him and said, do you want to get lunch? <laughs> and and he said, yeah. And so we literally sat down for lunch together for almost three hours um, in the lobby of the hotel, me, him, and his wife. And um, and we talked, and we disagreed about absolutely everything. It was really troubling. And and so, you know, as I say, like everything but the sweet kugel. You know, that was the only that was the only thing we agreed upon. Um, and I got up and like took, I literally took contemporaneous notes on the whole thing as soon as the meeting was over because I wanted to remember every word that we had said. And I was deeply troubled by it. I mean, I left troubled. So a couple years pass and there's this event that happens um, once a year on the saddest day of the year in Jerusalem where people go to the Western Wall and, um, and it, there was an egalitarian prayer service there and a bunch of violent religious extremists were bussed in from the West Bank in order to throw feces and chairs at them, as is their custom. And this guy, it's a true story, I'm sorry to say, I've been there. Um, and this guy, this rabbi, basically stands up and he's like, stop, what are you doing? He said, if any Jew comes here to pray, the only thing you hand them is a prayer book. You know, like you don't, you don't throw feces. Like he said, what's wrong with you? And he said, there is a sickness of violent religious extremism and we have to do something to stop it. And so anyway, the only reason I know this whole story is because somebody basically asks his advisors like, what happened? He's the guy in charge. And then he, so, you know, he switched teams. And, uh, and the guy says, well, he had lunch with Rabbi Sharon Browse once <laughs> a couple of years ago. And so, you know, I don't know. I don't know how much my lunch with him actually impacted him. But it strikes me the power of, like, when you see someone that's not coming toward you but coming at you and all your defenses are up and all you want to do is pull away, what happens if instead you stay at the table and you just have this uncomfortable conversation in which you try to see each other's humanity. You try to see if there's any overlap. Like the only, I mean, I literally realized he cared a lot about his kids and I care a lot about my kids. Like, so I was holding on to that for some time. So what if we force ourselves to stay curious about each other instead of branding someone as a traitor or branding someone as, you know, as a terrorist? Like, what if we actually try to see the humanity in each other? What do we lose? And what could we potentially gain? And most of the time, probably, you know, probably there isn't a happy ending like there is in my story. But sometimes every now and then a seed is planted that grows into something absolutely beautiful and transformative. So... Uh I, when you told that story, I think that it's a beautiful story, but I also was thinking, well, you must have told that story in the years before you had found out that he changed his mind, right? You never told it before. You, well, I guess the reason I say that is that, that, that his changing his mind makes the conversation you had even more valuable. But what value would it have had 
right? Like the reason his wife is there, yeah. right, is because he wouldn't sit down with a woman. Oh yeah, that's true. Because of the yeah. misogyny of his views about women. I'm sure he wouldn't want to be seen having lunch alone with a woman, yeah. Right, because you couldn't be just an interlocutor. You had to also, you, th that your womanness made yeah. it someone you can't, yeah. he can't sit across from, right? I guess what I'm getting at is at some, like, uh, but for, forget just feeling safe. When is it? When is the right time to say, you know what, we're not speaking anymore. You're someone I need to fight. Well, this is why I think that model from the ancient ritual is so powerful, because the person, the ostracized person, is one step short of excommunicated. Meaning, the excommunicated are not welcome into that ritual. But anyone who's short, just short, meaning someone who's going to blow this the place up, is not welcome into the place because it would render it unsafe. And I think we have to do the work of figuring out the difference between being unsafe and being uncomfortable. And we should not put ourselves in environments where we're unsafe. But we have to put ourselves in environments and conversations where we're uncomfortable. It doesn't feel good to do that. But the only way that we change as people is when we encounter other human beings whose ideas are different from ours and we end up growing from those encounters. So I think what you're asking is, what's the value of that conversation if it doesn't have the, you know, the Hollywood ending where there's like some Google alert that this guy, you know, changes. Yeah. And I, so the value of it is, I remain fully human because I am still willing to sit with this guy even though we totally disagree with each other, even though I think that his views are actually endangering the state of Israel and the Jewish people, and I know he feels that way about me, and even still, I'm willing to see him as a human being who cares about his kids and likes sweet kugel. Right. That is worth it for me because otherwise I become a caricature of myself when I make him a caricature of himself, and he is actually a human being. Well, as someone who's become a caricature of himself, I... <laughs> No, I no, I'm like actually I'm not I'm not pushing back on it. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I'm also what I I saw you give a talk about this and what I my honest what I was thinking when I was watching you speak is, you know, surgeons see opportunities to perform surgery, rabbis see opportunities to talk about the Talmud and find understanding. That is of a tremendous value, but Part of what made the fact that you were sitting down with that rabbi, that that ultra orthodox pro settler rabbi, interesting, is because all around it are all the people fighting, right? But the people fighting are creating, like those people need to be defeated, right? Like I, my my view, right, would be that 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 those settlers need to be removed, and actually more important to me than understanding is 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 the actual tangible outcomes in the world, right? And some people you'll never persuade, and they're not even arguing with you in good faith, right? Like, at what point is, at what point is it of more value to say, you know what, I'm sick of being curious, mm -hmm. and I may be a slightly harder version of myself, but that being a harder version of myself is what it's gonna take to get me to the other side of a fight we have to win. So this is not a panacea. Seeing another person's humanity does not solve problems. It does not take the place of just policy. It doesn't mean that we accept the, the wrongs that another person is committing in the world or what they stand for or what they believe. It doesn't take the place of it. It actually is bringing humanity into the fight. And so I think it's absolutely essential that we do both, actually. I think we have to continue to fight to see each other's humanity all while we're fighting the just fight, while we're fighting for a change in policy, for a change in administration, for all the, all the things that we care about in our society, we have to continue to fight for. But when we dehumanize the people who are on the other side of that battle, we're not winning. We're becoming a lot like they are. And so I feel this is really essential for us. I'm not, I'm not suggesting also that this work is for everyone. Um, there are, it, not for everyone all the time, right? <laughs> so you do what you do. I and just want to fight. <laughs> <laughs> right. By the way, I'm fighting too. I mean, we're just fighting in different ways. And, you know, there are people who are, who are like really to insist that you can still see the humanity of another person, even when what they, who they vote for and what they stand for and how they live is actually like actually hurts you. That's a spiritual, th that is spiritual work. That is very hard work to do. And I think ultimately that is, that's really essential for the kind of social change that we know needs to happen. Um, I called uh, uh, my dear friend Sarah, who you know, before I came here, and she said, oh, you should make sure you tell Rabbi Browse that Sarah thinks I desperately need the counsel of a rabbi. <laughs> I think that's clear to all of us now, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Do you have a favorite uh, joke, Jewish humor joke? Oh my God. I have one to close this out if you want. Yeah, please. Two old Jews sitting at a counter. One old Jew says to the other Jew, Morty, are you getting any on the side? And Morty replies, they moved it? <laughs> Rabbi Sharon Browse, thank you so much. The book is The Amen Effect. Check it out. It's a really good read. Thank you so much. Rabbi on the show. Thank you.